So, yesterday was the epilogue of my D&D campaign, um, Chronicles. Uh, and in this part of the series, I wanted to talk about um, some of the things I think I did right as a DM and some of the things I think I did wrong. Um, I'm going to start with what I think I did right. Um, actually, I'm going to also say a set of things I did wrong, maybe things I could improve, improve upon. Um, so, uh, things I did right, I think... Um, one, I really like my setting. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I think I did a good job at creating the atmosphere I wanted to create and sort of the, um, the, the feelings I wanted to evoke from the setting. Um, I, I also like the setting because I think it's a great place for the players. I mean, it was, you know, just after this horrible disease hit, a, you know, a place troubled by war and bandits and stuff like that. So a lot of opportunities for the players to, um, you know, go on adventures and stuff. Um, another thing I really like about my setting is that I continue, I'm going to continue to use the setting. I'm using it with my, um, other campaigns already. Um, and so everything that the players have done in this campaign is, has left a permanent mark on the setting. And I think that's one thing that I'm, I'm really excited for. I think that's something that the players can really engage into, uh, knowing that, you know, what they build will last um, until future campaigns, you know, if they build a stronghold, that stronghold will be somewhere that other players can go to or that they can go back to themselves. And, you know, um, if they inherit a kingdom, they can have kids who will inherit it, and maybe in future campaigns they'll meet their descendants way on. Um, so I think that's a lot of fun for both the players and both for me, and I think it also gives me a lot of content to use in the future, um, so that's nice. The tea today is Earl Grey uh, with lavender and a little bit of milk. I don't know if I brewed it for long enough. I think it needed to steep a little longer. But um, anyways, um, so I think it did really great with the setting. Um, another thing, I think most of my combat encounters were good. I think there, you know, there were a few that weren't great, but I think most of them were good. Um, and I really liked. Most of the antagonists that the party fought, I think, were, were really good. Um, I think there's, like, one or two exceptions in there, and I'll get into those exceptions. Um, I think my favorite, personally, was the Warlock. Um, essentially, this, you know, they, they're, they're at the starting town. Um, they've already done a few quests here. Um, and they get another one about this, you know, old Warlock, um, you know, who a lot of the you know kids in the town thought was just a myth, you know, a scary bedtime story their parents would tell them. But suddenly, you know, women are disappearing and being kidnapped and stuff. Um, and people are starting to believe that maybe that, you know, that old bedtime story was real and based on something. Um, and it was. And so they found this old warlock. Um, their first encounter with him, uh, they tracked him down to this goblin cave they had cleared out before. They had a terrible plan. Um, and I think I, I've already talked with... I'm going to talk about that maybe... Um, the time. They had a terrible plan, basically, and the Warlock escaped. Then they met with him again, um, and the Warlock escaped again. And this tied in with another story arc that's been still ongoing towards the very end. But um, anyways, he escaped again, very barely. Um, and then, actually, they had, they had, their first encounter wasn't in the Goblin Cave. It was in a smaller cave where he was about to sacrifice some young girl. And he escaped from them. So he escaped from them three times. Fourth time... They corner him in his lair. Um, this time they have the whole party and a couple extra NPCs. Um, and there's the warlock. He's on... This, this is a, It's a big cave, like 70 feet back. Um, and he's on this raised platform that's up about 15 feet. So for the players to get to him, they're going to have to climb. Um, and then he has two zombie ogres uh, that he's commanding. Um, so I think this... I want to talk about this in, in particular because I think this is one of my best encounters that I've run. At least I, th I felt like it was. Um, and there's a few things that I think I did well with this. Um, one, um, the Warlock was tough, but uh, I think the previous encounters in the party had demonstrated that he couldn't take the party on alone. Um, this goes a lot into the action economy and stuff. So the two ogre minions had a lot of hit points. But they were easy to hit, and they didn't do, they didn't hit that often. You know, they didn't hit the party that often themselves. And if they did, 
it was an amount of damage they could take, you know. Um, so they still had to deal with the ogre zombies, but um, they weren't too powerful. I felt like they were just right. I like I liked that sort of easy to hit, but have a lot of hit point minions um, that are just sort of a nuisance there. And they could block, because they were so big, they could block um, the different party members from getting to the warlock. Um, so what ended up happening was two of the party rushed forward to you know take the warlock on melee, because that was his sort of weakness, was getting him in melee. But then the ogres went, and they blocked off the rest of the party from getting any closer to the warlock. Um, and, you know, there, I mean, there's, you know, some people were able to slip by and stuff. But essentially, so they're fighting the warlock, and to add this all into the mix, on the ledge, he's about to sacrifice another girl, site to save her. Um, so, they're fighting the warlock. Um, you know, the, the two guys fighting the warlock take a lot of damage. The people fighting the ogre, um, they're taking some damage, but they're mostly, you know, keeping the ogre from control, and that way, you know, the people fighting the warlock aren't getting sworn by the ogres, too. Um, some people in the back are casting spells and, and stuff like that, and the rogue was doing something, um, I forget. Um, but, uh, so they take out the the uh, two ogres, um, or they take out one and they're about to take out the other, and then that's when they take out the warlock, and they're like, okay, we've got this, we're all ready to do this, and they're getting ready to run away with the, um, with the girl. Uh, but it comes back to the warlock, or when the warlock goes down, he doesn't. The warlock himself is down, but like this, you know, flame spirit, this this um, embodiment of anger, uh, comes out of him. And so now he's just he doesn't have a lot of spell casting. He's just able to do a ton of damage, and he's just tearing through uh, the party um, that was fighting the warlock. You know, there's a lot of people going up and down, um, and it, it, I thought it was a really exciting fight. They ultimately won, um, no casualties, which was good. Um, so I think there are a few things I liked about this fight. One, it was challenging, but it didn't kill anyone. They they felt challenged, but they didn't get... No one died. Um, second of all, I felt like the minions were perfect for the scenario, and they just they worked really well. Um, third, that little elevation change added a nice dynamic to the um, to the encounter, um, because it, it, you know, like, the less athletic characters had a harder time getting up there because they needed to make a strength check. Um... And uh third thing was it was sort of it had multiple stages, right? So they took care of the warlock, but then the this uh you know, Gru thing, which was which was the spirit of anger, came out and he was like this giant flaming monster. And had that second stage and you know, you still have the minions to contend with and I, I felt like it just worked really well, um, in terms of combat. And I felt like the warlock was a good antagonist because um you know, they had a couple warlocks in their party, so there was, you know, a little bit there. Or they had one warlock in their party. Um, but, you know, it was fun. I, I think looking for him was good. There was a good amount of... They had the few encounters with him, so they knew he was tough going into the fight, and they knew they had to be ready. Um, and the other thing is they ended up using the warlock's cave for their own base for a little bit after that, although they moved out later. Um, uh, so, yeah, overall, I just felt like that was... A really good fight, and that's like sort of what when I when I want to make a good fight, I sort of look back on that one. Um, I think uh, some other things that I did good um, at the start of the campaign. I don't think my um, role play and social encounters were that good, but I think I improved on them a lot. And I think for a lot of the players, some of those role play and, and social encounter moments were their favorite moments, um, or you know maybe not their favorite, but some of the more memorable ones. So. That I think I improved on a lot, and I think I'm pretty good at good at that now. Um, another thing, I think I'm good at the political aspects of because um, my campaigns tend to have a lot of political stuff in them, and I'm good at getting tense political situations going um, that are you know complicated, but not so complicated that the players can't understand what's going on, but they have to be careful about you know what actions they take. Um, what else? Uh, another thing I just like, you know, about my campaigns is how open they are. Um, that's my style is very, you know, open and sandbox. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's some of the stuff that I think I did really well. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff I could have done better with, though. Um, one, you know, there's a couple enemies and antagonists that just were, I felt kind of were shoehorned in, like the vampire they fought. That felt just sort of shoehorned in there. Um, second, um... I think, you know, I, I with 
in certain parts of the campaign, there were a lot of large scale battles and those are hard to run. And I think I came upon a good system there for a little bit, but I didn't keep using it, which I, I want to go back to using that. That was in the Battle of Revode. Uh, I think I had a really good system for, you know, commanding and stuff, but I didn't really keep up with it. I didn't use it again after that, which I think I should go back to that and write that, write it down too, to help myself remember. Um, so that's one thing. I think like a lot of the, I want to get better about using because uh, large groups of enemies. I don't want to use them as much. I think I use them too much. I think that's a bit of a crutch for me. And I think when I do, it's tedious and it's not as fun as it could be. Like sometimes it's epic to fight off, you know, waves of whatever, but it's also kind of annoying. And I want to get better at running, especially when, you know, the enemies are attacking. I want to get better at running that. Um, let's see, what's another thing? I want to make more diverse NPCs. First of all, I, I, I'm trying to become more aware of this, but I, I usually default to having the NPCs be male. And I want to have more female NPCs in there, um, just so, you know, for variety and, you know, representation and all that. Um, another thing about representation, a lot of my... And humans are the dominant race, so this kind of makes sense. Most of them are humans. I want to add more NPCs of other races, though. Um, so there's that. Um, I want to... Also, just in terms of personality, diversify the NPCs, because I think I tend to run, you know, it, it's just sort of what's natural for me, but I think you can see a lot of myself as a person in the NPCs, and I want to get better at running NPCs that are less like me. Um, let's see, what else is there? Um, I think the biggest thing that I want to get better at, personally, um, is encouraging player role play well it's three things really encouraging role play between players um and uh incorporating backstories more and downtime so for the encouraging role play between players i think part of the difficulties with that is i think one thing that i like about my campaigns and this is both a blessing and a curse is that everyone has not everyone but most of the players have multiple characters um which works in some situations but sometimes it's awkward because then people have difficulty role-playing between all the different characters and, you know, like, it might be, like, two characters that someone controls should have a conversation, but he controls both of them. So that can be a little awkward. Um, I think another thing to encourage player role-play, um, I don't know, I, I don't really know how to do that. I think um, it's difficult because it's, like, uh, it's it's hard to get people to do it without them doing it naturally. So that's one thing I want to get better at. I want to encourage people to do that more. Um, especially with my group here, my college group, I think you guys um, have a lot more character interaction, um, which is good. Um, I was going to say something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, let me take a sip of tea. Um... A little bit of lavender was in that sip. Um, anyways, um, I think... Uh, oh, another thing that I want to get better at also is traveling. Um, I think I tend to, you know, when traveling long distances, I want to get a better... I want to be able to better convey that feeling of you're traveling a long distance, but I want to be able to do that without it being boring. Um, that's sort of my main struggle with, with travel is like, you know, a few days I can, I think I can do well enough, but I mean, you describing day by day that gets boring, you know? Um, so I want to get better at that. I don't want to have to do every camp out every night, you know, cause again, that gets boring. Most nights you're not going to encounter anything. Most nights nothing's going to happen. And I think I can couple that with the player, uh, interaction things and be like, okay, you know, what do you guys talk about along the journey? Not and I think that's another thing is some of the phrasing I tend to be, do you talk about anything? I should say instead, what do you talk about? Because you're going to be talking with these people that you're traveling with. That's just sort of how it goes. So that's one thing. That I th that's one way I can improve and the one thing I think I need to improve on. Um, the other thing is incorporating player backstories. And uh, I think part of that is I need to talk more with players as they're working on their backstories which has its advantages and disadvantages. Like, I want everyone to be able to make their characters on their own and to consult with me. Um, and I want them to be able to do their ideas for their backstories, but I feel like a lot of times people will just be like, okay, this is the backstory, and it's like, 
oh, you've already finished it, and then it's like, I can't, it, I feel, it's, it's a little difficult to add in pointers and be like, okay, well, this is, you know, we can work with this. Um, but that's something I think I want to get better at and do more often of and say, and, you know, ask the players to work more closely with me on their backstories when they're making them. Um, and then, let's see, what's another thing? Um, geez Louise, uh, what did I say? Oh, downtime. Um, and I think, I think I'm having a good idea of how I want to do this, or getting a good idea of how I want to do this is sort of, but basically, I, 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 most, in all my campaigns, there's rarely any time spent on downtime, and I want to do more of that. One, I think, one thing I need to do is present more options, um, you know, like, players can do whatever they want, but give them some examples of things they could do. Um, the other thing is I think I need to make it more interactive, um, and I think I need to, you know, add, so add more to the downtime. I don't think, you know, it should be its own adventure, but, you know, give more details, give more, uh, sort of flavor there. The difficulty I have with that is I don't want to just talk to one player about their downtime for however many minutes, um, because everyone else is still in the group, you know, um, so I might try breaking people off into different groups and do it over, like, you know, through the week or something like that, if I can, and talk with them about it. Um, and that's that's what I'm going to try to do going forward. But those are sort of the things that I want to improve on and how I think I will try to improve upon them. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult, too, because it's just... I, I've been DMing for a while now, um, and I, I'm very comfortable with it, so I don't... I don't always prep as much as I should, and I think a lot of the stuff that I need to work on requires more prep for me. And uh, I think that's where I really need to work on it. it overall, is just prepping more um, and being less lazy. Because, um, you know, most of the time I can do stuff off the top of my head, but I think I rely on it too much, and I think it's a bit of a crutch. Um, so, yeah. Next uh, video, I think I'll be talking about talking with different players or having, you know, their clips of some of their favorite moments, least favorite moments, what they think I could do better and responding to some of that. Um, but this, this one was really, really rambling. Um, so that's that.